And that's that methodology that I like to apply to not just product design and technology, but actually to brand, how we think of brands as well, the, the sort of agile, iterative brand. And sort of seeing that visually all come together, you can have the experience, the, the strategy, and the, um, the design, the brand, and the technology all working together as one sort of team that's combined. And sort of thinking it about in sort of sprints that you might do the, the strategy and the brand development and the technology sandbox is sort of unboxed at the same time. So that we're all working towards this experience of the brand or this experience of the, the product that you may be launching. And so constantly we're trying to think of possible future horizons. And we always sort of talk about horizons and futures as in plural, because there are many. Um, futures are constantly emerging and changing and events change our horizons all the time. And one of the frameworks that we can use um, is this horizon map. And so you've got horizon one, two, three, and four. And at the bottom at horizon one, you've got sort of lower risk and sort of <coughs> time, shorter time to value. And then at the top, at horizon four, you've got higher award, but you've got that longer time to value. And along with that, you've got on the sort of concrete horizon one, you've got a lot of certainty. So you understand the technology, you understand the market, you understand where your brand is. Um, and there's a lot of known knowns. And then out towards horizon four, it's much more conceptual. And you think about that as sort of research, that those are conceptual models based around research. So you have a hypothesis and then the idea of science is to sort of disprove or prove those hypotheses. And then to horizon three and two, you have something that's compelling. So there's more unknowns, but it's compelling reason why you probably invest in that. And then that challenging horizon where there's unknown unknowns. So you know that there's something there, but it's quite challenging to get there. And to sort of make this obvious, there's, you may have heard of Guy Kawasaki, worked for Apple, super smart guy, brilliant in the startup world. He uses the ice cutter analogy. So I don't know if everyone knows, but ice used to be harvested on lakes in the winter. It was cut into sheets, wrapped in straw, and then shipped where it was needed to go. None of those ice cutters became ice factories. So when ice was made in factories, it was taken by a block, dropped off at someone's door, and then you could buy a block of ice to put in your cabinet. None of the ice factories became refrigerators. So then refrigeration was made and people would plug a refrigerator in. Now, there's not many ice cutters around and ice factories make, you know, it's a dollar for a bag of ice. So you become a commodity. So if you don't, jump that innovation curve, or I like to say, if you don't jump to the next horizon, you're gonna go out of business or you're gonna become a commodity. And I think the one build that I would put on Guy Kawasaki's uh, analogy here is none of the refrigerator companies are thinking about becoming the next nest to control climate. So let's just take a quick look at Elon Musk's horizons or his, some of his possible horizons. So when he started SIP2, Maybe that was his first horizon. Um, he sold that to Compaq. Um, Zip2 isn't around anymore. Um, so that's something that fell out of, the, went out of business. And then he came up with, went to PayPal. And basically PayPal was the idea of like, how do we fix online payments and mobile payments? Incredibly successful, sold to eBay for $1.5 billion. His sort of third horizon would be Tesla. And, and then actually the first time that someone had actually really sort of thought about electric vehicles and delivered it in a very successful way. And then his fourth horizon, if you look at it, is probably like Mars Oasis, so SpaceX and trying to establish a base on Mars. Now he may never get there, it might happen, it might not happen, but that's those perpetual unknowns. There's no, there's no sort of quantifying those unknowns. And that's sort of an example how you can use those horizons to A, look back at case studies, but you can also use those horizons 
to start plotting out possible future horizons that, and ideas that you would like to aim for. And then one of the um, tools that we can use to map future horizons is the futures cone. So we, we've got a timeline and then from wherever you are now is at one point. But then as you go out into the future, you've got sort of these you know, probable, plausible, possible, and preferred futures that you might want to map. And you can use this again to sort of work through like, what are some of the scenarios that we could start to think about? And you can look at things like patterns that are emerging. So you can look at future patterns, like what are some of those stable patterns? What are some of those unstable patterns? What are some of those sort of emerging patterns that you can sort of start to bring in and think about what are these possible futures that could go from this point and then plot them along that line? One of the other lenses that I like to put on that, if you just took one point on that futures cone, is to think about like P8 or P4. So, um, you know, if you just take four Ps, and really for me, the best advice I'd say is to start with people. Start with users, start with stakeholders, start with your customers. What is their sort of physical, psychological patterns around people? And then the next sort of lens out from that would be place, so physical places, public, private places. And then the next layer out from that would be platform. So thinking of technology, networks, what technology platforms and devices are being used. And then from there, out from there, is looking at the planet and thinking about what are the sort of global shifts that are happening around the world, be it sort of geopolitical, be it business, industry, resources. You know, so one big trend of the planet right now is, you know, we're going to have potentially 9.8 billion people on the planet um, in the next 10 years or so. And then so therefore, what does that mean for a brand or my business? Well, it means that we need to start doing more with less because we're going to have more people, you know, resources aren't finite. So we need to think of more and more innovative ways of how we can use the resources, but also deliver experiences and brands and services to people in the planet. And then off to the side, I would sort of look at this sort of lens of sort of um, purpose. Why does your brand exist? So thinking about you know, often people think brand is sometimes this rubber stamp process at the end where you put a logo on or a name. And that is one part of it. But really, the most important thing around a brand is why the brand exists and why does your business exist? And if you have a very strong why around what you do, why you do it, that's going to really connect and resonate with people from your brand experience. And then from that as well, you have things like practice and process. So the more that you practice and you refine your processes, your sort of um, your your sort of uh, uh, velocity of the sort of brand and your the way you deliver that can increase. And the the sort of last sort of P is the patterns, is understanding and watching out for patterns that emerge and collating those and being aware of them, you treating them as signals. And these effectively, these patterns are signals to try and help inform your future. So a quick, just thinking of a pattern. Okay, so global poverty, 1820 to 1910, um, declining global poverty, we've gone from 90% down to about 65% in 1910. And it, just put it in the chat window if you can, but where do you think that, that global poverty would be now? How much of the world? We've gone from 1820 where 90% of the world was in extreme poverty. And where do we think it would be now? Yeah, please take a minute and uh, just, uh, you know, mention in the chat, where do you think the global poverty is headed? This is like a small exercise for you to kind of predict. 
20 percent yeah if you could do it in percentage that would be great that'd be great 20 percent 30 percent 40 percent brilliant thank you um if i can do a jump out here yeah brilliant uh it's 10 percent so we've had this huge incredible shift of extreme poverty from 1820, when 90% of the world was in extreme poverty, down to about 10%. And what that means is there was this big, huge shift in innovation um, around the sort of 1960s onwards that has just sort of driven extreme poverty down. And it's an extremely positive example of how innovation actually helps to drive humanity. So one of the sort of real driving factors for me doing this was that, you know, you're all in this startup innovation world. And that's exactly what we need more of is, is clever people to fix the world's uh, problems. So let me just talk about brand experience. And I've chosen Apple. Um, I think it's a great brand. It's one of the best brands um, I think ever created. And I want to just talk about how brand experience, the brand and product and experience all come together as one thing. This is the Apple campus. So they, Apple decided to make the move um, and build a new headquarters and call it Apple campus. Everything about the building was considered. Um, there was some sort of uh, unhappiness around moving from sort of offices to this more open plan sort of space. Um, but what they found is it's been incredibly useful for more collaboration and to increase the flow of information. You think in a big organization like Apple, that that flow of information would be difficult, but actually having this space that you can work in and be opening increases that flow of communication. And then if you look at how they started to think about some of the sort of civic areas in, in cities like Milan or Chicago, and then take areas that maybe have been neglected and work with local councils and towns and mayors to say, how can we put this shop in, but actually sort of try and think about the area outside of that as well, to think about what is that space now gonna contain and where people can meet as well. And I think you can't help but par parallel back sort of really to older times where civic space and piazzas and squares were used for um, private houses and offices, but also that the sort of outdoor space in the middle was this civic public space where people used and shared and, and changed ideas. Sometimes there was a market in the square. Sometimes it was used for festivals. So environment, super important. And then we look at product release cycles. So I'm sure you're all aware of this, but if you look at some of product uh, release cycles, you can see that there's this introduction of a product, there's this growth, and then there's this maturity, and then there's this phase of decline. And so thinking about your brand saying, okay, this is a product life cycle. How does our brand uh, work with that product? And it also works for other parts of products that come in, but how does it work with that decline as well in a graceful way? And that's something that you really should consider around how the brand can grow, but also decline products as well. And then if we look at um, even down to the sort of fact that Apple have launched their own silicon chip, um, that sort of was a very strategic move with the product and the experience, but also it's part of their brand DNA that they would start to do that, that the shift to their own chipset would be that we want to be able to do this with our product and our software. So therefore, we need to be able to control that. And then this is a, a wonderful diagram, which is just, you know, off Wikipedia, which you can see all of products from Apple from way, way back in the 70s up to 2010, I believe. So the way they think about their products is all in one. So I'm going to go through rapidly through this section now. And I'm going to show you a series of images and products connected to the brand. If we look at the all-in-one from the 1983, 
And we look at the IMAP from 2020, and obviously the updated one today. Um, if you look at the laptop, similar thing. It's a it's keyboard, it's a screen. If you look at the desktop, it's a block that sits on your on your desk. If you look at a tower, tower that sits on your desk, and then everything in between is this block of technology that sits on your desk and a handheld. So if you look at the fact that you've got this handheld in 93 and the iPhone today. And just to pause there, like, you know, I guess post it in the, um, in the chat if you would, Something interesting about the form factor there, although the brand has changed and evolved and the products have evolved, there's something interesting about the form factor there where the form factor does stay the same because, you know, my fingers are pretty much steady, you know, my eyesight, my hands. Um, so therefore the form factor doesn't radically always change that much, but the experience and the design of that can change quite radically. And then if we look at software as well, but you know, the way software was delivered on like, you know, a DVD or a CD-ROM way, way back. And then how that's now been, that sort of network of delivery is almost invisible. It's in the cloud, but the touch points of that experience, whether it be a speaker that you're talking to or it's on your wrist, are still touch points within that brand experience. And then even down to the stuff that we don't see. So the chips that are inside, the microchips that are inside their products, there's still something of the brand. There's a residual part of the brand, not only in how they look and how that typogra typography and the metal looks, but actually in the thinking behind how they use technology inside as well. So if you look at their own chip, um, if you look at the M1, the brand on the outside is sort of an echo and a reflection of the technology on the inside. So if, if you look at these uh, cores here, there's a certain cores that do what they call fire core and that handle all the sort of user initiated actions and the ice core that handles all the sort of lower level memory used so that that technology that chip can remain cool it doesn't need to kick the fan in unless it's editing a piece of video or something or do something quite heavy with the processor so that even baking it back to sort of the technology and what the technology can do sort of connects to the brand in a way to say what do we stand for as a brand what do we stand for as a business and how do we want to deliver that experience to our users and then there's other ways that the brand is represented in, you know, more traditional ways where you make a film. And, you know, most of the films now don't get seen on TV. They're more likely to be seen on YouTube. So this is the film called The Underdogs. And some of you may have seen this. That's another way to express the brand. But I feel like that expression of the brand, the M1 chip, is far more important. It gets far more news coverage than that film does. However good that film is, it still doesn't get the same coverage as that new Apple Silicon chip. Um, so a question for everyone now, a quick exercise is I want you all to just get a pen and paper, a post-it note or whatever you've got or your, your tablets, draw on. Um, what is a brand? Just write out on a post-it note or a bit of paper, what is a brand? And we'll give you uh, 60 seconds on this, starting now.
Brilliant. And just uh, post your answers in the chat window. That would be great. What have we got here? We've got brand is the identity of your business. It's a visual and sentimental representation of an entity. Personality character of a business. A description and representation of your values. Brand is a promise delivered. It represents some of all attributes, beliefs and experiences in the customer's mind. The means of identifying with and relating to a product or service. Your character, what you stand for, your value proposition. The brand is an identity. It's how you want you or your concept to be represented to the public. Brand is a set of attributes, personas, all coming in. Brilliant. Those are great thinking here. Brilliant. Really good to see all these ideas coming in. Yeah. That's a really good one. A brand is the way a product, company, or individual is perceived by those who experience it much more than just a name or a logo. A brand is the recognizable feeling these assets evoke. Fantastic. Thanks for all those answers. Um, so let's look at um, a brand framework and think about potential ways of exploring the brand. Okay, so first of all, within the brand framework, you, you wanna define what the brand is. So what lies at the heart of your company and what defines it? And that's something that's, I feel like one of the hardest things to actually answer sometimes. And then, what is that defining idea? What's that big idea that actually defines? So how are you going to stand out? You know, what is different about you? And what sort of gap are you filling in the market? And I think some of these are sort of quite strategic, but I think that idea of like what makes you different and what lies at the heart of your company, for me, are two of the very key facets of defining your brand. And a lot of you said this, the vision. So the vision, generating a vision for the business is about really that sort of seeing the future and then understanding how that future you can actually realize that and I feel like through the brand you sort of the vision is this sort of exponential big thing in the future but the brand sort of delivers bit by bit it's sort of incremental that everything you do whether it be the logo that you make the color of your brand, the product you make, the way your staff talk to customers, the way your customers feel when they walk in a store. If your customers walk in a store and the sales team jump on them, that might be really off-putting. And so that reflects on your brand is that you're needy. Whereas if you walk in a store and you're given the space to look around because you're just curious, then that's trusting. And so many brands in retail make this mistake. How many times have you walked in a store and, and someone's trying to sell you something because they're desperate to sell something and you, you just straight away, you feel like you're pressured into buying something. The values, it comes to values. You know, what are the values that determine your brand? And the people that are in your business have to live those values. And the information you put out has to live those values because that's what people understand of your brand. They'll see your values come out in everything that you do. And lastly, like the who, like who are you as a brand? Because I think David Bowie said this, it's a brilliant um, quote, which was product plus personality equals brand, which I think obviously is a simple way of putting it, but it's a very, very clever man um, that, that said that actually a, it's not just enough to have a product, like you can put a packet of cereal on the shelf in the supermarket and what's to distinguish it between all the other packets of cereal? And there are features and benefits and there's nutritional value and there's the way it's made, but 
often people are going to connect on an emotional level. Like, do they trust this brand? Do they trust what you're saying? And that's what we do with people. We trust them. We don't trust them. We find them funny. We find them serious. I think that's a really interesting point to think about. So these are some of the framework and some of the questions you should start asking yourselves about your brand and your business. You can use that and start to think about that and expand on it. One of the other things I think you should start to think about as well is the brand experience and how that sort of connects on many different senses. So, you know, sight, sound, taste, smell, touch. It might not need all of those senses, but it's important for you to consider them all. So um, the address hotel here in Dubai, when you walk in, they've got a very peculiar fragrance that I really like. And every time I go into one of their hotels, I smell that fragrance and I'm instantly reminded of the brand. And for me, that's a really nice connection. It feels like I've arrived somewhere that is a really nice space to be in. Certain sounds. So, you know, how your car sounds when something is clicking or something is like you're indicating. What's the sound of that? That's part of the brand as well. What does, you know, the hold music, if you phone someone and for a business, what hold music, if it's horrible hold music, that's another reflection of your brand. So curating all these bits of the brand experience is super important. So, so many times I get, you know, a brand is a logo or it's an identity. That's one part of the brand. The brand really, if you look into it, is a very rich layered thing. Um, and the reason I used Apple as an example is they really understand the, the, the sort of value of brand because if you go into their stores or you use their product or the software or the hardware, all of that is orchestrated so beautifully that you understand what that brand means to you. And one thing that people do forget these days is touch. Like, you know, there are still things that are physical, so printed or books or could be a, a business card or it could be just the feel of a doorway as you walk into a store. What is that physical touch as well? It's really important. So, um, brilliant quote. I'll just give you time to read this. So that's, that's pretty amazing to think about that. To think that if Coca-Cola Twiz lose all of its sort of production related assets, the company would survive. But if everyone in the world forgot about the brand of Coca-Cola, they would go out of business. That's how important the brand is to Coca-Cola. And Interbrand is something you can check out. They do a fantastic global uh, report. Um, it's online to go and look. And they rank all the brands and how they've gone up or down. And they measure it by internal and external factors. So quick, another quick question. If you put the answer in the chat, does anybody know the GDP of the, um, the Earth, it, roughly? And no looking it up on Google, because I can't see you, so I can't see if you're cheating or not. So just go for it now. $100 trillion US dollars, yeah? OK. OK, well. I've roughly calculated it to be 85.91 trillion dollars, but that's from, I think, the World Bank. So it's probably wrong. It's changing all the time. Um, can anyone guess how much of that GDP is, to, is brand value? Again, just put the answer in the chat window. So what is the value of that $85 trillion? What is the brand value of that? And just, okay. It's just over $7 trillion. So <clears throat> if you think about that, that's a huge part of GDP around the world. When you think of all the production and resources and services, and just over 7 trillion of that is brand value. 
huge amount. So brand is super important for you to understand and to build within your, within your business. Uh, another exercise you can do in your own time is map out all the brands on a grid and think about why they're important to you and why you love to use them, okay? So that's something you can do as a really good asset to say, what are the brands out there that understand me and really understand how to deliver a brand experience? And another um, exercise I like to do is to use a brand canvas. So thinking about at the center of it, that sort of defining idea, the brand heart, what's at the heart of the brand? And then what are the brand beliefs, the promises, the language, and the connections out to the world? And so we'll just quickly five minutes before we sort of jump in. I think when we've got 20 minutes for questions, we we'll just take three minutes, I guess, uh, to take us up to 10 past. And just quickly think of like, what are, is the big defining idea for your brand? Just post-it notes. If you want to share it in the chat, you're more than welcome, but I understand some of you want to be protective around it. But just use a pen and paper and just start to write down what are some of the defining big ideas around what lies at the heart of your brand? What is at the very core of the existence of your brand? Or what would you like it to be? So just as you finish ideating uh, what's at the heart of your brand, feel free to uh, also keep your questions ready uh, for Gary. And uh, I've also posted a link um, in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to meet each other and kind of network a little bit, you know, have a chat about Founder Institute. We are on AirMeet. Um, as, as soon as the session ends, we all will go on air meet. So bit.ly slash Gary Hoff. If you click that link, which is in the chat, you will join us on air meet. Okay, brilliant. Um, and obviously, by all means, share any thoughts you had or ideas you had in the chat, but understand if you want to keep it yourself as well. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll um, you know, let Gary take the next uh, exercise. I think we're about to finish. Yeah. And, and I, so I'll let Gary yeah. conclude, yeah? I think, yeah, I think I'll wrap it up there, Samir. We've had a, um, a good session. So I'll just leave you with one thought. Just I'd encourage you to take this and just start your brand, start creating it today. You'll probably work with lots of different people in your businesses, with experts, with consultants. You want to work with really good designers, but start thinking about and start building and creating your brand today. And that's it. I thank you for your time. We'll go to questions. Brilliant. Um, thank you very much, Gary, for kind of, uh, come in, in and uh, presenting your thoughts on future thinking, brand and product. Um, I'll leave uh, the uh, session open for questions. We, I have my colleague Manal as well. Manal, if you can, um, you know, start collaborating on the questions and kind of start, um, uh, you know, getting the questions off to Gary so that uh, we'll, we'll use the 20 minutes more around Q&A. Thank you very much. We can also let, if you hand raise, we'll also let you talk um, and give you a few 
minutes to talk. If you have some questions you want to ask Gary directly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Samir. Thank you very much, Gary. That was fantastic session. Um, if I am to rename this session, I think I would say uh, inside ahead of creator. Uh, and it is, it is something that is um, beyond art or science. It is something that is, uh, I don't know if I make sense, but it is a divine thing. I mean, um, and I personally learned a lot. Um, yes, a designer is, might be a perfectionist, but um, we start from we, we start with the unknown and then we take it um, step by step to the unknown. So uh, we start with with the with the known, we form it, we validate it, we scale it into horizons. And why I am I'm finding uh, this uh, in, uh, particularly important because as an MVP um, a developer myself with no code, I've seen, uh, I've worked with many founders and I've worked with many, uh, you know, investors. And the one, uh, the two radicals I've seen, either you find founders who leave uh, design to the end or you find uh, founders that are very particular about the design that they keep refining, refining, refining the idea until it is, uh, until they have no uh, um, energy maybe or, 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 or um, uh, initiation to, to make it happen. So uh, um, I've learned a lot personally and um, I have a couple of questions. I will yeah. leave them to the end, but I'd like to invite all the um, attendees, all the esteemed founders, guests to share with us uh, your questions. You can either raise your hand or just post it on the chat, in the and chat you box. You raise the, just while we're waiting for some questions to come in, you raise a really good point about trying to make stuff perfect before you put it out there. And if you look at sort of the first Apple computers, a, a lump of wood with a keyboard and a, a type, you know, a keyboard and a monitor and, and with Apple just carved into it. And, and it was a way of then expressing what the first release of that product was going to be. And that's what I meant about those sort of incremental steps that you take with a brand that you, you change it, you evolve, and you move forwards. And I think there is a, a sense that today you have to be perfect in everything. And, and that's a good, it's, it's a good virtue to have, but it's also trying to say, well, what can we control now? So let's yep. focus on less and do something exactly. well instead of trying to yep. do too much in one go. Absolutely. I have one single question before I take questions from... Um, uh, to attendees who raise their hands. So um, I always wondered what is the uh, what is the essence of Apple logo? What is this Apple half cut Apple actually? Um, I've, I mean uh, we've all read the stories about uh, about it coming as, um, uh, as I mean so maybe uh, sudden inspiration maybe or by incidents. But uh, how, how do you, how do you uh, comment how on that? How do I see it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. And um, <laughs> for, for me, the way I read it as a, uh, someone who's been a customer of them for a long time is I see it on a few different levels. I see it as this sort of idea of um, the byte, you know, as in, you know, memory of computer. So the byte out of the Apple, I see it as like a, a byte in memory. Um, but I also see it as sort of something that's creative, that you've got something that's an apple and then you've taken a bite out of it. And so therefore it's changing that object and creating something. So that's just the way I see it. And then there's also sorts of things where, you know, there's a story of the apple falling on Newton's head. So is there something about science and art? So those two things that come together. So I think something that's nice about it is it is quite mysterious in a way. It is, and, it's um, mysterious because you don't know whether <laughs> the meaning came before or or after the uh, the brand. I, I it is uh, one of the like the Mona Lisa for me uh, <laughs> mystery. But yeah, thank you so and much. And I think there's something wonderful in this sort of idea. Of just if you can reduce, you know, logos become this simple thing, 
and logos have gone through all sorts of different periods of being super complex because they had to include every name of the company and all the details. So there is something interesting about how brands start to become so sort of connected to their customers that they can just become this symbol or just a very simple expression of it. Um, that's really interesting as well. Right. So let's thank you so much. Um, let's take a first question from um, uh, Tulsian, Dependra Tulsian. Can you unmute yourself, please? Let me just unmute you. Yes. You can unmute yourself now. Okay, let's take Mia Olstead. Hi. Hello. Hello. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me all right? Yes. 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 Hello. Hello. Hi, can you hear me all right? Apologies yes. for that. Okay. No um, thank you very much. This has been a fantastic session. Thank I you. came because I'm, we're currently working on the brand for a consortium of about 350 different environmental organizations on the West Coast. We are all working in climate change. Some of those organizations are three people strong, some are 250,000 people strong. It's large brands and small brands. And so trying to come up with a logo and a branding identity for the cooperative of all of these different brands who are unique in their own way, it has proven to be quite challenging. And I'm curious about where you would sort of start and how you would proceed along that journey when what you're doing is trying to create a mega brand of brands. Well, it, yeah, it sounds really interesting what you're doing. That sounds like a massive challenge. So I can understand that it must be a, a big challenge. Um, I guess my suggestion would be to start with what brought all those companies together? What's the core belief and what lies at the heart of bringing all those brands and companies together? And what's the purpose of that you know, network or cooperative or whatever it is? What's the sort of core purpose um, and what's driving that and I feel like that would be a really good place to start looking into to understand um, what that community is about what those brands um, bring to that network and what the objective of that is so what lies at the heart of that is that something you've looked at oh yes <laughs> yeah. um, you know the, the common factor is we're all uh eager for there to be more action within climate change. And yeah. um, we are very focused on British Columbia as a province. Yeah. So those are the two yeah. probably biggest common denominators. Yeah. But some are, you know, Extinction Rebellion, who have very strong politics and ideology on one end. And then the other is the David Suzuki Foundation or Sierra Club, which already have these very well-established brands and want to make mm. sure that any cooperative that they're a part of does not infringe on their brand story, which mm. is completely understandable. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, you know, no, no easy answers, but it's sort of, um, I think sort of coming back to what the objective is around sort of what's the power of bringing together all these disparate companies and brands and organizations and sort of working from there to sort of almost have that sort of, mission and values that that helps to drive that that part of the brand and so yeah I, I'm not going to have an answer for you because there are no easy answers um, <laughs> no I appreciate but... <laughs> I appreciate the fact that you're you're uh, validating my struggles <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> so, <thanks> so much. <laughs> have a good one I appreciate it yeah thank you for your question good question Thank you, Gary. Um, we have another question. Uh, actually, it is a common question by founders. Uh, so um, uh, what is your advice for, for new founders to avoid the mega 
you know, the um, uh, they make a they make a cost of of a branding uh, when they start. What would what what's your thoughts? Uh, what could be an ideal and easy way to start them to in the formation the, the, the uh, of the MVP, the minimal? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a good point. I think there's a couple of ways. I think. And that's my point at the end here is sort of start creating the brand yourself. And, you know, it's about thinking about what lies at the heart of that, that brand and what you're trying to do. Um, and then the expression of that is going to be in design. So there's, there's nothing wrong with you starting to formulate a brief or thinking about the brand or have a go at it yourself. Um, doesn't mean you have to put it out there right away. But you can test that with users. You can do focus groups. You can um, show it to friends and family and see what they think. See if it rings true or there's something that just doesn't make sense about it. So definitely have a go at it yourself. That's one thing that you can do. Um, and then also think about bringing on designers and creatives or um, that could come into the startup and actually maybe they take a bit of equity or whatever it is, maybe they're really behind the business. So that's another way of thinking about it is how can you bring someone creative into the business can start to think of your user experience, your product design and your brand to so someone that can start to stretch their skill set. That's another way to think about it as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, Samir, do you wanna add uh, anything maybe or um, no? I start uh, shifting to yeah, air meet? So, so we can switch to air meet. Um, what I also wanted to mention is we're hosting a lot of these uh, interesting sessions by top speakers. Uh, so yes. definitely stay tuned. Uh, if you have any questions regarding the Founder Institute program, fi.co/slash faq is the best. Uh, you know, which, which actually gives you a lot of information about the program itself. Our next cohort, which is a GCC Silicon Valley cohort with top mentors from Silicon Valley, as well as about close to 180 mentors from the region is beginning on 6th of July in case you're interested to enroll. So do take a look at that. Um, uh, would definitely love to also receive any questions via email um, and, and our email is uae at fi mail. Fi mail is like founder institute, fi mail.co. So if you have any questions or you wanna ask any questions offline to Gary, um, please do send it on this email and we'll consolidate and we'll kind of seek a response from Gary um, at his earliest convenience and availability. So. Um, Gary, I'd like to thank you very much for the session, um, for um, helping the founders and the entrepreneurs, the, the one-upreneurs understand about brand and product. Um, and Manal, uh, thank you for coordinating. Thank you so much, Samir. Thank you for Gary and the audience. And if you'd like to have one-to-one -one discussion with Gary in the upcoming 15 minutes, please join AirMeet link right away. Thank you and have a good evening. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.